Hello and welcome to a fresh new episode of the Forever Forward podcast. I am your very familiar host Sid and today once again I am joined by my colleague Umesh for a discussion on the state of solar operations and uh, where we'll discuss existing challenges and how companies can uh, overcome these challenges to drive a more productive, sustainable and high performing assets. A uh, very warm welcome to the episode Umesh. Uh, thanks, thanks, sir. I, I mean, I was I was hoping that I would be as familiar as you are, but probably that's not the case. <laughs> I've so, thanks, become thanks. more familiar uh, in recent times. That is, that I would so like cool. to think so. Uh, no, and, and, and you deserve that as well. In case if that's that's what's happening. No, so my pleasure to be on this call. Yeah. So just before we dive into the discussion, mm-hmm. I would like to give you some context to begin with. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is according to a study by energy market analyst Mercom, which says right. that the solar industry faced a $4.6 billion revenue loss in 2023 mm-hmm. due to right. equipment underperformance. And this right. figure is just for the US alone. Okay. And they also say the large a large portion of this loss stems from system level faults and assets not operating okay. at all these levels. Right. So my first question to you is even as solar capacity and renewable technologies are advancing, uh, what could be the reasons for assets underperforming and not generating the output that's expected? So, so thanks. I mean, and that's obviously a staggering number. If that number is just for US alone, you could probably safely maybe multiply it three times uh, or maybe at least double it. So you're probably looking at a $10 billion revenue loss. Now, that's annual in nature, right? But more importantly, the the challenge that I see or the issue I see with the with, uh, the renewable energy capacity not uh, performing at optimum levels is because of its promise to solve uh, bigger issues like climate change and energy transition. Every unit that falls short from renewable energy is uh, one step backwards to where we would have wanted to be as a country, as an economy, as a world, right? So it carries far more weight than just a dollar value in terms of revenue loss. So when you were when you were to look at that as an opportunity loss, uh, that would be significantly higher in number. Now coming back to your question on why that could be, there could be multiple reasons, right? Like uh, supply chain issues, the quality of the, I'm not going to stem into that. That's not our domain. Uh, but, and, and for a moment, I'll also like to classify uh, that, that, that when you look at solar or renewable energy uh, uh, you know, plants, then you would have to segregate it into two, three different classifications. One is IPP, and we are not talking about independent power producers, plants, which are large, it's large in number, uh, I mean, they're, they're bigger in size. They have a very good operations and maintenance regime, a very good regime in terms of handover, right from installation, commissioning. So we're not covering them uh, per se. Where we are going to be focusing is the more decentralized ones, or let's say, for example, in case of solar, solar rooftop. Now, even there, you would have a classification of whether you're going to look at residential or you're going to look at commercial and industrial, uh, right? And even within commercial and industrial, you would classify where the facilities have a decent maintenance team on site and or or exposure and where you don't now the problem in our experience over the last 18 to 24 months of managing a significant portfolio in australia um, and also uh, understanding and talking to different uh, companies has been the residential space plus the cni space where you do not have dedicated teams looking into the performance of solar uh, right now what typically happens if i could just uh, probably expand upon it you put up uh, a fancy new thing, it's, it works well to a decent point in time. So the problem happens that when the handover is happening or when the installation to commissioning is happening, you don't check everything as much as you should be checking. And then gradually over the course of the next 12 months, 18 months, you know that, that's where the thing starts to fall apart. Now, all of these have been invested for a long term, like 10 year, like the payback would be seven year, eight year. Even if it's five years, you're expecting these assets to run for 10 years. Uh, there is obviously a certain markdown you do year on year on performance. But uh, so in short, there is a lot at play, uh, right? And we know, we've understood that this is an issue. Uh, and that not as, that not only causes revenue loss, but also obviously it takes us away from our entire agenda of climate change or energy transition. Looking at all these problems that exist right now, hmm. what change or shift do you propose in the approach to the overall how solar assets are operated and maintained? 
and again, uh, 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 a disclaimer, I'm no expert uh, on this. Uh, I mean, obviously, hopefully, over a, over a period of the next few months and years could claim to be so, just as a way we've probably built credibility in the in the building uh, space, in the built environment space. Uh, I think whatever I understood uh, is that everyone's very eager to sell uh, systems. Not everyone is very eager to talk about the post-sales part of it. And that could be because your post sales is not anywhere as strong as your sales is. And so it's best not to be spoken about. So I, I, I don't have a very specific answer, but the, the top of the answer that comes to my mind is that awareness, which is not in terms of education, uh, right? But awareness in terms of business model and, and like, so there has to be some change. Obviously you have to tell the customer, the end customer, whoever is buying that solar asset that, hey, Here's what the impact of maintenance is. Here's what you should be doing. Here are some best case practices. Obviously, take a judicious call on who you want to engage on doing maintenance. Like, you know, I think that should happen. I don't think vendors are doing that enough, to be very fair. I think the entire focus largely lies on. I mean, if it's done on build, own, operate, then it's a different ball game altogether, right? Because when it that in that case, or if it's done under a resco mode where someone is buying from you electricity for 10 years, then the and if the onus on operation and maintenance is not on the end as like the beneficial, then that's fine, right? Uh, but in most cases, that probably is not the case. And uh, so I think you need awareness, plus you also need a business model or a data shift that can help create a case where, uh, you know, the owners can, asset owners or the ultimate beneficiaries can understand the dollar value of not being able to maintain the assets properly and then decide whether they want to continue with the ineffective practice or they want to solve for it, right? So uh, uh, it's like, uh, you know, having a freemium plus a premium model, you can subscribe to a, to an activity where you're getting very specific outcomes. And then uh, it could very well happen that, hey, uh, you know, if, if someone would like to probably subscribe to that, get that solved. So for example, there could be someone who has sold the solar uh, asset uh, or installed could offer an additional service. Uh, and then once the asset owner comes to know that there's a problem with their system, uh, they could either take the service from the, from the installer itself, or they can choose from any other installer, like outside, but at least you make them aware. And this itself is something which is not happening to very large level. Even though when you look at, there are so many different OEM player, OEMs available at scale at which investments have happened, scale at which inverters are put, scale at which batteries have been put, uh, and hoping that this improves. So I, I think uh, my, my my shorter answer to this question is that I, I think there is, apart from I mean, awareness, which is less of education, but more of business model uh, change that needs to happen, uh, is how I think we can solve this, especially in the decentralized asset space. So if the business model change comes into play, then to complement this change in approach, uh, what do you think are the tools or the overall technology stack that solar companies should be looking at? So that's right now, and also to set themselves up strongly for the future. So I think that's a very interesting question. And sorry, I should add why the business model shift, because the revenue at play, the recurring revenue at play from maintenance now is very significant because of the number of installs that have happened. Right, which needs to be maintained. So you are looking at a big market. Your total addressable market is significantly bigger than what it would have been a few years back. So it uh, it is understood why someone did not make a move in post sales uh, services in in digitized debt, so on and so forth, three to four years back. But not doing that now, if you want to remain a prominent player, doesn't make sense. Uh, so that's just an additional point to what why the change and shift uh, from the business point of view. Now coming back to the recommendation, I think whoever has listened to our podcast on, on what your technology stack should be for operations and maintenance, you know, so A, that answer will not be different. Uh, the reason why it not it is not going to be different because the process, the the, the process of asset performance or, or, or operations and maintenance is the same, right? The asset in question changes and hence some of the steps within that framework might change, but overall the concept remains the same and hence you need the similar tools uh, or same set of digital tools or processes that need to happen. Now, the only change that could happen, perhaps in this case, versus the conventional work that we are doing with facilities management, right, is that the FM company is actually getting paid, so they know that they're getting paid to do something, right? Mm -hmm. 
Now, in this case, it may happen that a lot of people would, may not enter into an annual maintenance contract, right? Now, under that, how do you still generate revenues? And hence, your stack has to be. So in my view, there are four different uh, uh, integrations that should be available. The third one could be could be, could be be an integration with any payment mechanism, Stripe, so on and so forth, multiple uh, uh, you know, are involved. But you're looking at, so the three elements is your stack should allow you to have a cost-effective triaging, which means not only detecting an alert from the OEM, because that the OEM provides, by the way, anyone lis listening to this conversation from the solar uh, world, you would know that OEMs will send out monitoring alerts and say, hey, here's the error, here's the insulation error, so on and so forth. But the point is, how do you cost effective triage it to the point that you're being able to provide very specific recommendation? Uh, that's, that's, that's important. And then how do you uh, have a digital opt-in model for the end asset owner where they could receive this, they could receive a job card, and then they could accept whether they want to. They, they will have an opt-in uh, versus an opt-out, right? So they can opt-in and say, yes, come in and, and, and do the service for me, right? And the cost of the service is X, and I acknowledge that I'll have to pay that. So, right, you need that mechanism to be in place. And then finally, getting the job done effectively, which means you don't, now, once you have what you also see in typically in the past for the same kind of a work two to three times people have to go now you can't do that if you are charging the customer for it because ultimately you'll eat up your margins so which means your work that gets done has to be done effective you will have to have mechanisms to counter check not only from data but from qualitative data filled in the job done to see if things have been done the way they should have been done and then the last part of it payment, which means how do you ensure that the, that the end, end customer pays? There could be different uh, sort of processes to that. If you are already an energy retailer, you could add that onto your bills. Uh, if you're not an energy retailer, you could simply have payments being done via different uh, sort of payment gateway mechanisms. So that's, that's, that's how it should be done. It should be end-to-end -end digital because the point is, the issue and the bottleneck is, just as the way we've spoken about control command center and facilities management, is that Everyone trying to do this puts a lot of people on the, uh, you know, at the back of it. Not that the people are not needed. So I kept on saying supervisory effort is always needed. You will always need supervisory effort. But the point is that you can't scale these services only on not having proper digital uh, digitization and digitalization in place, plus automation in place. Uh, running all of this is super expensive and probably uh, not effective. So I, I would say that is all that's needed and the last point is I always say there has to be the no, there has to be the knowledge loop that should go on currently there's zero there's absolutely zero so if fm was is, is bad uh, solar rooftop onm is, is worst i mean from that point of view from the knowledge repository point of view so they have a great deal of job i mean job to be doing there yeah so that's what my recommendation would be on approach and technology stack I hope this has been some good food for thought for the companies in the solar space. Uh, for me, I'm at the end of my questions here for this episode. So, um, but, but maybe if I can add, when you say it could be a food for thought, and again, a disclaimer: we are acquiring these as we we we, we continue on our journey to build the best of uh, technology for operations and maintenance, irrespective of what the asset class is. And we are very eager to learn, understand if some of our, our inferences are not correct or they could be better, uh, you know, please feel free to let us know. Good, bad, ugly, yeah. if it's a feedback, if it's a if it's a comment, but absolutely eager. I, again, the second part of the disclaimer, solar uh, operations is something that we've picked up over the last uh, 18, to 18 months. And obviously we've acquired whatever we could have acquired, but happy to stand corrected or happy to add anything that can benefit the community. Thanks. Also, perhaps we could have them over to the channel and have a different conversation than this one. To oh, absolutely. Get some absolutely. Different perspectives. Absolutely. So thanks a lot for tuning in and uh, stay tuned for more interesting conversations on the Forever Forward podcast channel. Thank you. Thank you so much.